start over. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at different generations and how they relate to technology. So we start by talking about the older generation, the baby boomers, and then we move to the Gen Xers, and then we move to what I call the net generation, born in the 1980s. Then we move on to the I generation, with a little I in front of the word generation, born in the 1990s. And now we're already starting to talk about what we call Generation C, the more connected generation of kids actually born in the new millennium. They are very different. They approach technology very differently. And even a specific technology means something different to a Gen Xer versus, say, an iGener. So for example, a cell phone might mean to a, a Gen Xer a way to get the ball scores, a way to check the stock market, a way to look something up on the internet. To an iGener, it's the, their way to communicate with the world. It's how they see the world, it's how they connect to the world, it's how they check Facebook all day long, it's how they text all day long, it's how they go on the internet all day long, but for social purposes. It's a very different view of the world, and it seems like where we used to have generations that were about 20 years long, now we're looking at generations that are maybe only 10 years long, and it's totally because of technology. The technology changes so rapidly that every 10 years or so, there's a new generation of kids who approach it differently. Perfect, perfect. We've just started looking at Generation C, and the C is for connected, collaborative, creative, communicative, and this is the generation of kids born past the year 2000. They were born into a world where Facebook existed, where iPods existed, where Wii games existed. All of the technology is something that literally was part of their birthplace almost. And what we're seeing from these kids is they are the ones who are growing up thinking they can do anything. You have eight-year-old kids who are computer consultants to people in business already. You have nine-year-olds who are designing their own applications for cell phones. My computer consultant is nine years old. Mikey, my computer consultant, helps me with any computer problems I have. I just need to email him, and he will email me back almost immediately and tell me what to do. This is a totally different generation, and as they grow, we're going to keep studying them, obviously, but they are going to be very different than their older brothers and sisters. They don't see technology as a tool. They see technology the same way we see air. It just is there, it exists, it's all part of their world, and this is the meat of their world. It's surrounded by technology. One of the things that we've noticed in all of our research studies, particularly with teens and tweens and young children, is that technology has sort of started to focus on communication. What they do is they don't necessarily surf the internet. What they do is spend time communicating while they're surfing the internet. And we've also noticed that this generation, these kids who are teenagers, younger kids, spend a lot of their time looking like they are multitasking, meaning they have you know, a screen here, a screen here, the phone here, and they're glancing back and forth and back and forth from one to the next. What we've started studying is what we call task switching, which is really what they're doing in their brain. And so what they're constantly doing is juggling tasks. They're juggling the text that just came in with the post on Facebook that they were in the middle of writing, with this, with that, and going back and forth. And we've started to look at how that affects them both in a positive way, allowing them to juggle multiple communications, and potentially in a negative way too. One of the issues in communication which I think is really critical to understand, is that generations communicate differently. So I'm a baby boomer, born in 1950. My daughter was born in 1990, and so she is an, of the net generation. She's a typical 21-year-old. Um, she texts, probably sends and receives 6,000 texts a month, pretty typical for a teenage girl or a young adult girl. But the communication is difficult because before I really understood this, I would try to call her on the phone at school, and she would never return my call. And I'd say, well, I called you. Why didn't you call me back? And what I realized was that, that she just kind of ignored phone calls because that's not her communication modality. So then I realized, finally, that if I wanted to talk to my daughter, I had to text her because that was her main mode. And I discovered that almost by accident. I texted her something one day and said, what do you want for dinner? 
just joking around. And immediately, within three seconds, she texted me back, here's what I want. And so I realized that this is the way we're going to have to adapt our world. I find out most about what goes on in my family through Facebook. My kids communicate on Facebook, and that's where the meat of it is. It's just a different world, and I think those in my generation and even some of the generations afterwards, the Gen Xers, are going to have to get used to the fact that their kids communicate differently than they do. Okay, so when you look at generations, the baby boomers and the Gen Xers were born and raised into a world where technology wasn't the main focus. When you switch from Generation X to the net generation born in the 1980s and the I generation born in the 90s and now this new Gen C born in the new millennium, you're looking at very, very different ways of seeing the world and very, very different ways of communicating. The, the group of people born really before the, the 1990s and mid-1980s are really coming into technology later in their life. Maybe by the time they were in school, some of us not even until college, these young kids are playing with technology from day one. You give them an iPhone when they're a year old and they will know how to use it. It's a very different mesh of technology and because they were born into a world where eye devices existed, where the, the internet was just omnipresent, what you're seeing is they grow up with a different idea that some people call being a digital native, being born really into a digital world, whereas those of us who are older, they call us digital immigrants because we came into that later on. For the new generation of teachers. One of the things that's interesting in being a professor is that you teach to people of different ages and a very broad age range. So in any given course, I could be teaching to a 17-year-old or to a 70-year-old, literally. And so there is a disconnect in how they communicate. The older ones end up emailing me a lot, and the younger ones all want to friend me on Facebook, and they all want my phone number so they can text me. So I have to balance off how I communicate with people in different modalities because they're different ages and different generations. It makes teaching much more difficult when you have a broad age range that you have to teach, as opposed to, say, teaching in a high school where your students are all between 16 and 18. Then they're all going to be basically hooked into texting and Facebooking. Interest to all the multitasking. You know, the studies on multitasking are interesting because, in general, what we're finding is, is that kids task switch often. We've done research, we've gone into their homes and watched them study. About every three to five minutes, they task switch. And the task switching is almost always to something technological, a text message, an email, an IM, a Facebook post. Something technological gets in their way. What we're also starting to find is that it may be the case that the younger kids are better at task switching than older adults are. Part of that is brand new research and nobody's really sure, but what we are starting to see is that there's something called a resumption lag. Once you stop the interruption, how long does it take you to jump back into the original task? Looks like younger kids might be better at faster jumping into a task so they can jump, take a text, go back and read a paragraph of their book, take a text, go back and read a paragraph or a page, post something on Facebook, come back and study. They can do that a little bit more seamlessly than people who haven't been raised in this heavily task switching environment. Okay, next gen versus the connected generation. Well, you know, education is facing an interesting challenge these days because the educators are primarily baby boomers and Gen Xers who are not raised with technology, but now you're looking at who they're teaching and they're all technologically sophisticated and have been raised with these devices from day one. So the teachers are having to change their style of teaching. A lot of people are going to what they call a flipped classroom, where you give the students assignments to go home, look on the internet, watch these videos, read this material, look at this uh, video play, and then come back and in the classroom have the students discuss it. The reason they're doing that is because the kids would much rather watch a video at home. They'd much rather be able to task switch while they're studying. Other teachers are finding that they're having to allow the students to have their cell phones in the class, to be able to text the teacher, to be able to look up things on the internet, they're really having to switch their mode of teaching. I've been trying to introduce a strategy in schools called a tech break. 
And it's a very simple process, but what it does is it gets at the fact that students are constantly being distracted in their world. They're being distracted from their cell phones and the visual image of a text coming in, the sound of a text coming in. They're also being distracted from inside their head. They have an internal distraction that says, gee, I haven't been able to look at my cell phone for 10 minutes. I wonder who texted me. Gee, I haven't been able to check Facebook. I wonder if my friend posted a response to my status update. And so what I'm doing in classrooms is having the teachers do what I call a tech break. Every student gets to bring their cell phone in. They get to look at their cell phone, text away, check Facebook, put it face upside down on the table. Now we have a lesson for 15 minutes. If you people in the class pay attention for 15 minutes, then everybody gets a tech break. And the teacher yells up, it's 15 minutes, tech break. Everybody pulls their phone, text, put it back down, focus again. What that does is gets rid of that internal distraction. They no longer have to say, gee, I wonder who texted me. They know 15 minutes I'll be able to check it. We're also using tech breaks in the family because so many families are being distracted by their cell phones at dinner, at a restaurant, at the kitchen table, that we're even recommending that families use tech breaks. Okay, everybody check your cell phones before we sit down to dinner. Okay, turn them upside down, stick them on the table. Let's have a family discussion because we know that family dinners are good for kids. They help them develop their social skills. They help the parents interact with the kids more. But if everybody's checking their phone all through dinner and mom and dad are looking at their email and their kids looking at their texts and Facebook, then there's no communication. So if you use these kind of tech breaks actually even during a meal, you get 15 solid minutes with your kids and then a tech break and then maybe 15 more minutes and then maybe as much attention as you're going to get from your kids anyway. But for the majority of people, you know, one of the interesting things about studying generational differences is watching how they interact in the same settings. And one of the things that we're already starting to see is that the younger generations who are coming into the work world believe that they can do it any way they want. They believe that they should just be given some work and let them do it at their own pace. Pick a due date, it'll be done. I may have to work 48 hours straight to do it, but it'll get done. Don't tell me how to do it. Don't make me come into an office nine to five. And that may not mesh with the expectations of their older, perhaps Gen X or even baby boomer managers and bosses. The difference is though, is the young kids, these kids from the net generation and the I generation, have been raised with everything possible in cyberspace. Anything you dream, you can do. If you dream of an app to play hockey games online, you can create an app to play hockey games, or probably somebody has already created the app. So this generation has gotten this concept of branding, that I'm going to brand myself as an entrepreneur. I can do anything I want. Whether that meshes with reality still remains to be seen, but when you look at who's creating all these new companies, all these new apps, we're looking at younger people who are dreaming of this. And that, I think, is a very critical split in the paradigm of how we are watching the work world maneuver itself. We're no longer in where the bosses are setting the rules and the younger people are just following them blindly. Younger people are branding themselves. They want to be picking up skills. They want to learn new things. They want to do things in a social environment. And they approach the world very differently than the bosses in the business world. Um, one of the interesting questions is how will this, these new generations stack up in terms of creativity? Because they're really working within environments that are primarily digital, parents and many educators are arguing that they're not being able to have enough time to just be creative and to free think and to play with imaginary friends and play imaginary games. But the reality is turning out to be a little different. These kids are actually one of the most creative generations to come along. And that's because they have a wealth of tools within which to create. If in a classroom, for example, a teacher gives her sixth graders an assignment that says, study this topic and prepare a project. In the old days, the project probably would have been a written paper. Maybe as we've gotten a little bit further, it might have been a videotape or something. Now, sky's the limit. These kids come in with incredible kludge together projects with video, audio, all sorts of technology, 
QR codes scattered all over the place, augmented reality, the sky's the limit for these kids. And they really are being creative within this world that gives them the tools to be creative. Kindness or empathy, is that, is that affected at all by that? One of the things I'm really interested in is how people communicate. It's all part of being a psychologist. What we're finding now is that so much of our communication takes place behind screens. We are not looking at someone's face. We are not talking to them face to face. We don't see their expressions. We don't see their hurt expression if we said something nasty to them. We don't see them crying. We don't see them smiling. What we see is a screen that we're talking on. And this is really changing our way of communicating. One of the things that I stress a lot is that parents should be teaching their kids this concept of context. What context is, is I am in a context now. I'm existing in this space at this time. And if you're communicating to me, you need to know my context. If I'm communicating with you, but you're behind a screen, I'm texting you or sending you an email, I don't know what your context is at the other end. You might be in a great mood, you might be in a sad mood. I have no idea, and I have no idea how my two-dimensional words are going to impact you psychologically. So one of the things that we're having to work on with parents and teachers is this concept of teaching kids that everybody lives within a context, and you have to remember and keep reminding yourself that there are human beings at the other end of that screen. You can't see them, but they're there, they exist, they have feelings, they cry, they laugh, and it's really important to recognize that. One of the things that I tell people all the time when I lecture is consider the following. You're going to send a message. You're going to type an email. You're going to send a text. You're going to post something on Facebook, say. Go ahead and write it, but then let it sit for a bit. We call it an e-waiting period. Let it sit for a minute, two minutes. Go away. Reset your brain. Go do something else on the computer. Go get a sandwich. Go get a cup of coffee. Then come back and reread the message before you post it. And ask yourself, is this going to hurt somebody's feelings? Is this going to make somebody happy? Is this the way I want my message to be received by the other people or person at the end of the line? And that's really an important thing to do. It also helps us become more conscious of how we appear to the world through our two-dimensional writing. Excellent. That was perfect. Thanks. In the, in the cyber world. You know, bullying is a very interesting idea because we're used to the concept of bullying on the school grounds where somebody will come up and push another kid and they'll get into a fight. But when they push that kid, they see his face. They see what happens to him. Cyberbullying is so different because it happens behind a screen. So you don't see that other person's face. You don't see the tears. You don't see the hurt look, the shocked expression. And it's much easier to bully somebody when you don't see them. Your kid's use of technology. One of the things I always tell parents is as soon as you put an iPhone into your child's hand, as soon as you let them play with your iPad, as soon as you let them send their first email sitting up at the desktop computer, you should start talking to your kids about technology. It's really critical. You have to talk to them about ethics. Even at a very young age, you have to talk to them about the proper ways to use technology. You have to talk to them about how other people's feelings can get hurt across technology. You have to talk to them about images they might see that they might be uncomfortable with. I highly recommend that parents have, starting literally at the age that they first give their kid any technology, every week, one day a week, a family discussion about technology. Short, 15 minutes, no technology around. Sit down on the ground at roughly eye level because parents who are much taller than the kids have much more power, so you want to bring yourself down to a lower power level. And I tell parents, ask your kids, what have you done this week with technology? What interesting websites have you seen? How are you communicating? And then parents zip their lips, smile a lot, encourage your kids to talk. And I tell parents, one minute of parent talking, five minutes of kids talking. Let your kids talk, absorb the information, see what they're doing. Pay attention to the way they're using technology. Are there any problems cropping up? Can you see any hesitation in their voices when they're talking about something? Be a parent. It makes humans so drawn to that. You know, humans are drawn to communication. 
But an interesting situation happened probably about 30 years ago when we started getting the internet and electronic communication tools, people realized that A, there was going to be more communication coming in that they were going to have to deal with, and B, that these tools were really easy to use and you could multitask with them. So one of the things that people like about communicating digitally is they can quick zip off a text message, go back, type an email, go back, do something else on the computer, come text something else, email, chat, whatever, and they can switch back and forth as opposed to talking face to face where they can only do one task at a time or as opposed to even talking on the phone where if you're on the phone and somebody else hears you typing then they're going to name you right there they're going to say you're not paying attention to me but if you can type something to them when they're not listening to you then it's really easy so these new communication tools actually allow people to communicate more not less and the kids do it all the time, of course. This is, this is their main mode of communicating. When you look actually at the data, earlier generations, their main mode of communication is face-to-face. -face. Younger generations, their main mode of communication is texting, Facebook, and IMing. Not even emailing. Emailing is an old thing now. It's very interesting. It's very interesting different generational differences. And you can imagine, if you, like me, you've got a 21-year-old, and I'm 60, almost 62 years old, our communication is different modalities. So rather than making my kids adapt to my mode, which would be either face-to-face, -face, on the phone, or perhaps email, I have to adapt to them and text them, Facebook them, message them. And so I've, I've had to adapt in order to, to make that communication successful. Yeah. Very different. It's a very different world. So that. You know, what's interesting is the technology's actually totally changed our morning routine. We used to be just wake up with our alarm clock, we'd go make breakfast, we'd take a shower, we'd get in our car and drive to work. Now the first thing we do is we reach over to the nightstand, we grab our phone, which has been next to the nightstand in case we wake up in the middle of the night and want to check our email, we quick check our email, we check our texts, we might go on our computer, we check Facebook. We have so many more things to do in the morning and it's because we are constantly connected. And if we've just gone six, seven, eight hours without being connected, we feel lost. And literally, one of the things we're finding in our research is that there's a core group of maybe a third or more of kids who allow themselves to be interrupted in the middle of the night by a text, an email, or a phone call, and allow themselves to be woken up, check it, respond, go back to sleep. And we're finding that that's actually causing a lot of sleep deprivation among school students, which is becoming an increasing problem. What are the effects of the, like the sleep deprivation in general? You know, when you're, when you're sleep deprived, um, your brain doesn't function as well. That's the bottom line. And so the neurons don't make accurate connections in your brain. And your brain starts daydreaming. Your brain needs sleep in order to consolidate all the things that you did during the day, all of your experiences during the day. And so this brain is busily working at night, but if you're constantly waking up to check your, your text messages, then you're not allowing your brain to do its vital nighttime work. And that's really going to hurt you because it's gonna make it harder for you to remember things because that's part of what the brain does is it consolidates all the good stuff that you learn during the day. It's gonna be harder for you to pay attention. It's even going to be harder for you to multitask because you just don't have enough of your brain working at the same time to allow you to do that. You're seeing on the internet, and it's totally because communication happens behind a screen, is that either behind a screen, you can quickly escalate a fight, or behind a screen, you can quickly assuage a problem. So you will see, for example, if you go and watch a YouTube video, there'll be people commenting on the video, and you'll see if somebody makes a comment that's kind of nasty, maybe somebody else will chime in, somebody else will start arguing with them, and it'll go back and forth and back and forth. On the other hand, the good side of that, the flip side, is that if, for example, um, somebody posts something on a social media that says, I'm having a bad day, my mom's real sick, uh, something on that order, they will start getting a lot of empathetic responses to it. And they'll be actually feeling better because of the communication. Being behind a screen makes it easier to do both bad communication and nice communication. It allows both sides, and we're starting to see more. 
Best example I can give you is on your birthday, if you are on Facebook, you will get hundreds of birthday wishes. That's because everybody's alerted that today is your birthday. Even though you know that, you feel great that everybody's wishing you happy birthday. That's the positive side. So my newest book is called Eye Disorder, with a little I, thanks to Steve Jobs. And in the book, what I do is explore this idea that the technology is actually making us all look like we have signs and symptoms of psychiatric disorders. We all look like we suffer from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. How do we know that? Because we're constantly checking our phones all the time. If our phone is missing, we go scurrying around everywhere to find it. We're obsessed. We all are showing signs of narcissistic personality disorder. If you look online, what you see is people going, I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 using those kinds of terms that make us look narcissistic. We're all getting a little voyeuristic and maybe suffering from some of the symptoms of voyeurism. We're all certainly suffering from attention deficit disorder symptoms. We're all certainly suffering from other kinds of things like body dysmorphic disorder where we see how good people look online and we don't feel that we look that good. There's some theory that, that there's something called Facebook depression potentially where we're watching how everybody on Facebook looks like they're having a great life and we're not. And so it makes us feel depressed. I spend a lot of time in the book talking about really simple strategies for bringing yourself back, reining yourself in. I'm not talking about giving up your technology. I'm talking about is finding ways to keep your mental health. And that's what's really critical. We don't need to be obsessed. We don't need to be addicted. What we need to do is use these technologies for their best benefit. Real world more. What would you, what would you suggest? If somebody came to me and said, look, Dr. Rosen, I really feel like I'm obsessed with technology. I'm addicted. I can't put it down. But I really want to connect with the real world. I really want to be now part of the real world. What I talk about in eye disorder is how to do that. For example, one's very simple. If you go out in nature for 15 minutes, and I don't mean you have to walk into a forest, just go outside, look at some trees. That turns out to reset your brain, calms your brain down, allows you to not feel as obsessed about the technology. If you just talk to another human being for 15 minutes, the same effect. If you laugh for 15 minutes, the same effect. So what I'm recommending is, is that it's not an issue of giving up your technology to make you human again. It's an issue of balance. And granted, the balance is tipped way this way already. We're using way more technology time than we're using FaceTime. So we have to tip it back a little bit. We have to have more FaceTime. We have to have more nature time. We have to laugh more. We have to do things that are not technologically based. So, there's lots of ways to do that, lots of ways to reconnect with the real world that doesn't require you to give up your technology. So it's a family connection. Reconnection. Many families are feeling very fractured today. And part of the reason is technology. Everybody's got their own device or devices. Everybody's usually in their own little techno cocoon in their room, in the living room, in the den, in the kitchen, wherever it is, using their technology. One of the things that I recommend is that there are two really critical things you can do in a family to increase cohesiveness. One is weekly family meetings. No matter how old your kids are, no matter how old you are, you can sit down on the floor once a week for 15 minutes and the parents can talk to the kids about what they're doing technologically, swap ideas, use it as a time to share. The other thing is family dinners. The research shows that four or more family dinners a week absolutely critical to family functioning, good family system functioning. What I recommend is that you sit down to dinner, everybody quick check their phones, don't put them away, put them on the table upside down. That way it's a signal to your brain that says, I'll get to you in a few minutes. 15 minutes go by, everybody pick up their phone, check their messages, check everything, turn it upside down. What this does is it allows the family to both have their technology in front of them, know that it's there, they're not going to be disconnected, but also know that they have 15 minutes right now to talk to their kids, kids to talk to their parents. Use that time wisely, then check in with your technology, then use 15 minutes more, then check in, then use 15 minutes more. You usually get three of those in a good family dinner, and if you do that four or five times a week, perfect. Family will function better. 
There are basically three or four things that scare the heck out of parents. Number one is online sexual predators. Parents truly believe the media message that says, predators are roaming the internet ready to capture your child. Research shows it's not true, and the research shows that most times that kids are contacted by somebody with unwanted sexual advances, it's not a predator, it's a peer, and 90% plus of those kids handle it correctly, and 90 plus percent of them are not affected negatively. The second issue is cyberbullying, and cyberbullying is a major issue. It's not that people are out there intentionally bullying other people, but what's happening is people are making nasty comments behind the safety of a screen and not noticing that the person at the other end of the screen is negatively affected, crying, upset, and continuing to bombard them with negative comments because they're getting no feedback. And this is an issue, and a really important issue for parents and families to keep in mind that your kids, if they start to act a little strange, a little more sheltered, a little more cloistered, watch out for the fact they might be being bullied online or receiving negative messages. Then there are a couple other kinds of issues that parents are worried about. Meeting strangers that you meet on the internet, having virtual friends. Um, the research is showing this is much less of a problem. And then um, the last one is pornography. And there's a lot of access on the internet to pornography. It's no longer the case that you just have to go out and buy a Playboy to see anything. You can now just put in a couple of keystrokes and you're there. And this is again another issue that parents should be working on with their kids to make sure that they're not assaulted by images that are not appropriate for their developmental level. This is just, you know, obviously you just have to guess, but how are, how is the human race in general gonna be able to continue to communicate? Uh, what do we have to do if we're gonna keep getting more and more things that are gonna be distractions for us? If you ask me about the future and you ask me what our world is going to be like 10 years down the road, I'll have to tell you that I don't know, first of all, but my guess is, is that just like everything else that we've seen in our world, it's kind of like a pendulum. And right now our pendulum is swung way this way. We are communicating heavily electronically. We are on Facebook. One out of every four minutes on the internet is on, spent on Facebook. We are texting. Teenage girls send 5,000 texts a month. So we are really all the way this way. I think what we're gonna start to see as the years pass is that we are gonna start to electronically communicate less, fall back more to the center. We're still gonna be communicating, but we're gonna be a little bit more judicious about it. It's not gonna be all consuming. And we're gonna start learning how to pick and choose what we wanna do. I think right now, we're almost being driven by the technology. Something new comes out, we've gotta try it. We've gotta do it. We've gotta use it. I think after a few more years, I'd say five plus years, we're gonna find that we're a little less enchanted with all new technologies and we're gonna to start to pick and choose the ones that fit into our world the best at that moment.